So that reminds me too, there's a, who's, I think Peterson brought this up, but I also read it somewhere else where like the emperor is the lowest figure of mocking and they just parade him around and like strip him down naked and, you know, throw food and stuff on him. And it's like the lowest of the low. Um, like this would have been one day, I think he was talking about in, uh, in the, I think it was in the Assyrian Empire, I think that he was talking about or the Babylonian, someone, one of the, one of the Eastern empires where one day of a year they would humiliate the king. Right. But in, in that sense, it's kind of like interesting where it flips, you know, it's like the highest becomes the lowest. And, and I, I suppose we see this in Christ, right? <laughs> right. Christ is the ultimate version of this, that, that pattern. You know, he really brings it to a limit that is, that is hard to, to over, that can, can't really be, uh, there's no more virgin after his version, right? right? In his version, he, the, the crucifixion is so extreme in how it does that, that I don't see how you can, and it, we even, every time I talk about it, I just, my mind short circuits because I can't contain all the <laughs> yes. elements. Yes. I can't, I can't, yes. I try to, and I'm like, I'm okay. So it's like, I'm like, okay, he's on the cross. There's a, there's a panel, which is saying that he's the King atop of his head, but they're actually mocking him. So it's sarcasm. I kept, I talked about this recently where sarcasm is part of the end of meaning because it's, you say something but you mean the opposite of what you're saying. So it's like the last word because it's saying something, but, but understanding it while you're using a statement, you're actually saying the opposite. And so right. like he has yeah. a sarcastic statement above his head, which is saying King, uh, King of the Jews, but then ultimately that sarcastic statement ends up flipping in the resurrection where he does manifest his kingship. And, and then you're like, you know, what, what? And then you also have a weird moment where the Romans put that up, right? Right, King of the Jews. Uh -huh. But then the Jews are saying no. Then Christ resurrects and he becomes King of the Romans. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. it just, if you keep going, because there's more, right? Just keep going. Right. And at yeah, some yeah. point, it just shatters your whole category system. It's so, it's so, there's so much in there. Yeah. I, I keep trying to tell people, I'm like, yeah, like modern movies, like even the good ones, they're good, but like, when you approach the Bible in this manner, it's better. And it just gets better and better and better the closer you look to it. Because like you learn something, right? It gives you like this platform of understanding. And then you stand on that and look and reread it. And you're like, yeah, exactly. oh my gosh. And then you read something else and you read something else. You come back to it, you read it again from another platform. And you can see further, deeper, more intricacies. You know, it's more hyper-connected. It's just yeah, exciting. I don't know. It's yeah, it is an exciting, exciting right? experience. I mean, it's meaningful. Like it's life. You know, it's not like some limo place where you're like you can't go to Arkham, you know, and you know partake in the the Batman universe. Like that's yeah. not possible. Uh, but you can go to Jerusalem. You know, yeah. you can't go to Jericho. You can go to Egypt, um, and you can participate in this story in, in a way that's like narratively unfathomably deep and profound, and at the same time you get to like act it out and be a member yeah. in it not like as a playtime but actually like life really life, yeah oh you're right yeah it's pretty it is definitely amazing i mean i'm excited also to see people realize it like realize that you know there's been a sense in which we there has been a sense in which a lot of the christian message has been moral which is fine like a kind of moral idea you know christ is saving you from your sins is saving you from these moral feelings that you have and so there's an emotional there's an emotional uh healing you maybe that you go through you know through that but i'm just i'm excited that people are also seeing that the actual narrative itself is so intense like there's so much in that story that you you like i said as soon as you start thinking about it too much you all of a sudden you short circuit you have to kind of wait and then come back to it later and and notice even more so yeah yeah and you know your brother's book your work alistair roberts i mean there's james jordan's book uh through new eyes have you read through that one yep. mm. so i mean like uh, what these things have like just at least personally opened me up and many others to be able to read the biblical literature with such a profoundly holistic and engaging way like like I was reading through the headlines and the the outlines of the gospels recently and it just amazed me where it's like you know if I were to approach this as like say like my from my California Buddhist days like it's not that impressive 
you know, like it doesn't list out these like head twisters or these like super simplified condensed, you know, sayings that really get you like, oh, wow, there's not a whole lot of that. And then like, narratively speaking, like on the surface level, it's like, it, it doesn't do a great job telling a story because it like blurts out the ending and the, res the resolution all the time. <laughs> like, especially in the gospel of Luke, it's like, oh, and the reason why he said that is because he's going to be killed. <laughs> You're like, oh, well, come on. That's like taking the cliffhanger out of it. Um, but then when you like take a step back, read, you know, and watch your material, your family's <laughs> material, uh, Alistair Roberts, like so many others. And all of a sudden you're like, oh man. And then, and then you read the context from which it was unfolded or blossomed, which was the Old Testament. And you realize, oh man, this is not just the climax of one story. This is like somehow, like miraculously, this is the climax of like 50 stories or a thousand yeah. stories yeah. all at once in history. Like, no, it's amazing. And you can, and, and uh, even in the text, there's a sense in which if you, if you're attentive, you can notice that the disciples don't totally know what's going on. Even as it's happening, they're kind of have, they have this insight, but they don't have enough to fully put the puzzle pieces together. And then, and then when it's over and they, they, they receive the Holy spirit, all of a sudden it's as if it all just comes crashing in on them yeah. and they just kind yeah. of realize they have this insight about how it all connects together. I could just yeah, imagine meaning them overload. having that, that like one momentary, because they were with it, you know, and they saw these things and they were all kind of mysterious to them. They, they knew enough to say, well, there's something, we need to follow him. Like there's something there. And then all of a sudden it hits them like, this is like, this is the end of the story of Moses, right? It's the end of the story of Adam. It's the end of, yeah. and it all kind it's of, David, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the prophets. Yeah. You know, gosh, it's don't. even the outsiders. The cool thing about, yeah. um, so like say Alistair Roberts book, uh, Echoes of Exodus. So he takes all of the different role players, um, you know, so like even with, you know, Pharaoh, uh, the messianic type deliverer figure, um, the different symbols of crossing water. But the interesting thing is the role of women and then the role of the Gentile. And you see by the time of Acts, you take this outsider kind of on the fringe character. Yeah, Ethiopian eunuch slips. Yeah, that story. Like, there's so much in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, it's like the main point is Rome, and you're like, oh man, the people that are off on the side, you know, they only got like a line or two, maybe, you know, or they're the bad guys the whole time through, you know, the Exodus story and through the Philistines and David and the the um, restoration period or exile period, and all of a sudden, boom, like they're the whole point, and Paul is directing all of the attention towards. Uh, and if you if Rome. you go outside of scripture and you continue the story, you realize that. Then when Rome converts, just what that means and what it is in terms of this this reconciliation with uh, with Esau and in the gospel, like the relationship between Rome and Esau is there. People they struggle to see it because it's not super obvious. But Herod is an Edomite, and so Herod is a descendant of Esau, and he's and he's a a king that was placed by the Romans on the 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 jewish state but he wasn't a jew oh, interesting. he was an outsider i mean he probably practiced a form of of judaism but he was not he wasn't he was not in the of the tribe he was an edomite he was a descendant of esau and so so like wow. for you can understand that even in the first century in the story of jesus there's a relationship between rome and edom in the story where it's like they kind of fuse together as this character like you know the the kind of cane figure that wants to kill his brother um so anyways yeah it's pretty it's just it's pretty and also because even later the 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 early rabbis they made that connection explicitly like when they say they talk about the kings of edom in their own rabbinical text they're talking about rome basically wow. so wow, wow. it's just really fascinating yeah well just it see like it the other thing that roberts does that i feel like really helps me because i have a musical background mm. is that he says, like, if you approach literature of the Bible musically as like a controlling metaphor, then that helps you understand how the writers are playing upon different, call it movements, uh, you know, like different uh, plot structures and motifs. Yeah. So like whether it's symbols or uh, different patterns, con highly condensed patterns that you can see either stretched out or played with kind of like how Hendrix would cover Dylan, you know, mm -hmm. or something like that, where there's 
there's something recognizable in it, but then it's something unique all to its own. And just in your example, the fact that they're playing upon not just a few of the themes from Genesis, but like several of the different variations upon like, like say the, like how you said it in our last uh, conversation, Genesis one through three is like the pronouncement of the core pattern. Mm, and, yeah. and then you see all of its different variations uh, and expansions in Genesis. And so like in the gospels, it's just amazing how it's like the master conductor, how they're, they're, they're acknowledging, including all of these different themes within 20 chapters. It's fascinating. Yeah. And it's hard to, and it's hard and it's also done in a way that doesn't call attention to itself. And I think that's why a lot of people um, miss it because like the, the, the style of the gospels is just so simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a lot of the, like you said, for example, like if you read some Buddhist text and there's like this amazing, uh, you know, contradiction that is so clearly stated as a Cohen that you that wants to kind of jar your thinking and stuff. Whereas Christ dissimulates the things he does in a very simple, common uh, story and, and very simple, common things. And so it's sometimes so you can also have sympathy for people who don't necessarily can't see it because it's. Christ himself tells us like, it's like for some people, this is just going to be veiled. Mm -hmm. It's going to, it's going to appear as veiled and they won't understand what's going on. Um, so, so you can sympathize with people who are just like, what is this, this, what is this story about this guy who like he gets killed by the, you know, he gets killed by the Roman state, you know, uh, by his own people and the Romans. And, and it was like, this is the foundation of a religion. He said some good stuff, but mm -hmm. you know, that, so, but, I, that's, that's a good point. The, the sympathy aspect, because when I was re reading it, just like I mentioned before, taking a step back, right? Mm. And just kind of maybe having an exercise where I forgot all of the different ways of seeing that I've had the fortune to learn over the years and just like compare it as such to other books. And it's like, you know, it might be kind of gray, but then all of a sudden, you know, you have teachers come, right? Whether it's reading your books or, you know, priests or theologians or storytellers or someone inside, right? And they, they hold up like a flashlight and it's like a blue light or something. And all of a sudden, all of the letters like come alive and you can see like different color patterns and uh, different uh, like ultraviolet. Like it just becomes something so much more, you know? Yeah. And sometimes it can happen to you even. So, so one of the, some things that sometimes what happens to me is there are some stories which are still on the back burner for me that I don't understand, like even in the gospel. But I but I've had enough insight and inside moments in some of those stories to think, no, it's not the story. It's me. Like, that's for sure. Yeah, it's definitely yes, not the story. Yes. Right. Uh, but there are moments where, you know, I look at some detail in scripture and I'm like, what is this? Like, I don't know. I don't know. What is this? I don't, <laughs> yes. what, is, what, what, what is this talking about? Why is it such a big deal? Uh -huh. But then I usually like, I'll just leave it there. I'll just leave it and just continue on my life. And then sometimes out of the blue completely, you know, like it just, it's like a lightning bolt that hits me. And then when I see it again, I'm thinking, how could I not see this before? Yeah. Like, how is yes. it that I couldn't see this was what it was yeah, yeah. about? Yeah. And so, so then you're like, okay, well, that's, it's kind of like that for everybody, I guess. Uh -huh. And for a, a lot of people, because there are still some stories that, that, that when I look at them, I'm kind of like, nah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about that. I don't know what that means. Like, I don't know. Why is it that Christ is saying that? Or why is he doing that? So. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, like in our last talk, you talked about um, the donkey. Why does Christ ride the donkey, right? Another kind of odd story to me is like, why go get the fish and find a coin in the mouth? Like, what the heck was that talking about? Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden you go back and you read like the book of Numbers or like First Kings or Chronicles or something. And all of a sudden you, you read some, some detail in that story that all of a sudden just opens everything up to what's being told later, like thousand years, 2000 years later in the gospels, you're like, oh, you know, it's kind of like that musician that just has that lick and he knows just the mm. right time to put it in to acknowledge what happened before, but then make something new. But then the really interesting thing about the gospels is that it's really filling in the details of the end or the full mm. picture as yeah. well. Yeah, it's filling up the picture of the, 
like the kind of vision, the final vision of, of it all, you would say. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs>